Hello and welcome to this lecture on the 1948 general election uh, in South Africa. Before I get started, um, I should just say that pretty much all the information contained in this lecture came from these two excellent books. Uh, one of them, this one, South Africa, Rise and Fall of Apartheid by Nancy Clark and William Warger. And, uh, the se and secondly, from uh, this, The Rise of the South African Reich by Brian Bunting. Um, so I thoroughly recommend both those books if you want to get a deeper knowledge of some of the issues raised in this lecture. But we're going to focus on the 1948 election um, and really the factors behind um, why the National Party won that election. So <clears throat> the 1948 election victory for the National Party is hugely significant as this was the first time the party had won an election since splitting from Herzog's original National Party in the 1930s. Under the leadership of D.F. Milan, the National Party had since then become much more racially chauvinistic, taking open inspiration from Hitler's racial laws, and their victory in 1948 led to over 40 years of apartheid, their signature policy apartheid, meaning basically a system of enforced racial segregation and discrimination in every sphere of social life, political, economic and personal. In this lecture, I will look at the reasons for their election victory, focusing in particular on four key factors. Firstly, the growth of Africana nationalism over the preceding decade or so. Secondly, and I will argue most importantly, the impact of World War II. Thirdly, the National Party's electoral strategy. And finally, the electoral system itself. So to begin with, it's important to understand that the basic ideology of the National Party is Africana nationalism. And without the growth of Africana nationalism, therefore it's unlikely that the National Party would itself have grown to the point where it was able to win the election in 1948. So I'm going to give you a bit of background to Africana nationalism before moving on to exactly how it developed uh, in the 30s and 40s and how that contributed to the election victory. So Africana nationalism is rooted in the belief that Africaners are a distinct national group in their own right, separate from black South Africans, separate from English speaking whites, and separate even from their Dutch uh, and German ancestors. At the heart of Africana or Boer identity uh, is an antipathy to the British, their historic enemy, and to black people whom they refer to as the Bantu, over whom Africana nationalists believe they have an almost divine right to command. Indeed, there's a strong religious dimension to Africana nationalism rooted in their interpretation of Calvinism. Calvinism teaches the doctrine of predestination, which holds that humanity is divided into the elect, uh, God's chosen people who are destined to go to heaven, and the damned who are destined for hell. Adding a racial dimension to this, Africana nationalists in the Dutch Reformed Church believed that Africaners were clearly amongst the elect, while the Bantu were the descendants of Ham, cursed for all eternity and predestined for Hades. Africana national identity started to develop particularly after the Great Trek of 1838 when the Boers left the British controlled Cape Colony to control new territory of their own and escape the British ban on slavery on which their economic life depended. It was then greatly boosted during the Boer War of 1899-1902 when Britain invaded these new republics, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, and incorporated them into the British Empire following the discover, discovery of gold and diamonds there. The brutal methods used by the British against the Boers, including scorched earth tactics and concentration camps, all greatly boosted Africana nationalism and hostility to the English. Indeed, it was in the years after the Boer War that Africana nationalism really got underway, with the foundation and flourishing of a large number of Africana cultural organizations promoting Afrikaans language, culture and history. The author Brian Bunting actually describes Africana nationalism in this period as compensation for defeat. Robbed of their political independence, Africana nationalism developed a type of cultural independence instead, where Africaners could retreat into their own organizations, just as they had once retreated to their new republics in the Great Trek. The formation of the National Party was part of this trend, formed in 1914 when J.B. Herzog split from General Smut's South Africa Party in opposition to their policy of conciliation with the British. Africana nationalism was given a further boost during World War I, where many Africaners were horrified that they were being dragged into a war on the side of their historic enemy, Britain, against the only major European power that had actually supported them during the Boer War, that is Germany. 
Indeed, some Boers even attempted an armed uprising against the government in protest at the war, which they viewed as a chance to re-establish Boer control of South Africa and escape the dominance of the hated British. The uprising was defeated, but it gave a great fillip to Afrikaner nationalism and led to a surge in support for the National Party. The National Party first came to power in a coalition government with Labour in 1924, where they implemented a raft of segregationist and discriminatory measures, such as laws against sexual relations between black and white people and a toughening up of the colour bar, banning black people from skilled work in key areas of mining and manufacturing, alongside a host of measures promoting Africana identity and language. All of this helped boost Africana nationalism as a pragmatic ideology that would protect the culture of the Africana and the privileges of the white working class, and all of this boosted the National Party as its leading force. So that's the background to Africana nationalism up until the 1930s, and we can see it as a steadily growing force in South African politics, really from the Boer War onwards. But in 1931, disaster struck. The knock-on effects of the Wall Street crash led to a financial meltdown, first in Britain and then in South Africa, and Herzog's response was to form a coalition with his old arch enemy, General Smuts, to tackle the economic fallout. When, in 1934, the two parties actually merged to form a single party, the United Party, this proved too much to bear for D.F. Milan, a leading force amongst the hardliners in the National Party, and he led a group of 19 MPs who refused to merge with Smuts Party and who then formed the so-called repurified National Party. This point can be seen as Africana nationalism at its lowest ebb, reduced to around a quarter of its previous parliamentary strength, and now effectively ditched by its own leader, Herzog. So I now want to go into our first factor in the National Party's victory in 1948, which is how Africana nationalism grew over the next decade and a half from this low point in the early 1930s, and helped bring this repurified National Party, now led by Milan, back to power. During this period, the National Party, having been reduced to a small group in Parliament, made great efforts to build up its strength outside Parliament, amongst poor white Africana communities in particular. It focused more on church affairs, greatly helped by the fact that its leader, Milan, had been a leading minister in the Dutch Reformed Church before turning to politics, and social welfare programs, as well as sporting and education initiatives. It really became, during this time, a grassroots community organisation as much as a political party. Africana nationalism was also developed through the Bruder Bond, a secret society of powerful Africanas from all fields of social life, dedicated to maintaining white supremacy and, uh, <coughs> and promoting Africana power in all sectors of society, social, political, cultural and economic. Milan had joined the organisation in 1934 and helped to reorganise it, modelled on the structure of the Nazi party in Germany. Indeed, the ideology of Af Africana nationalism was very closely linked to na Nazism, focused as it was on the idea of a state run in the interest of a specific racially defined chosen people with a strong emphasis on prevention of racial mixing. During the 1930s, this influence grew particularly strong, with the National Party becoming openly anti-Semitic and a number of openly pro-Nazi groups formed, in including Bora Nazi, the New Order Group and the Grey Shirts. The broader bond played a key role in the develop of African, development of Africana nationalism during this time, helping to develop separate Africana institutions in the field of sports, scouting, students' unions, and even an Africana version of the St. John's Ambulance. Brian Bunting described this process of bringing Africanas into their own separate organizations as being like a spiritual great trek, where they could withdraw from contact with other segments of the population, be they black people or English-speaking liberals, who were seen as dangerous or polluting. He says, once beyond the wall, Bunting says, they became easy victims of the nationalist virus. So we can clearly see how this process uh, aided the National Party by bringing Afrikaners out of mixed organizations and into their own racially separate social groupings. Afrikaners were insulated against liberalizing currents more associated with, for example, the United Party, and were more likely to be subjected to and susceptible to nationalist propaganda. The broader bond were also largely responsible for organizing the massive commemorative events for the centenary of the Great Trek in 1938. This involved a large-scale reenactment of the entire trek, following the same route as the original had done, all the way from Cape Town to Pretoria, with huge nationalist festivals at every town and village along the 900-mile route. These events led to a tremendous upsurge in nationalist feeling and activity, 
which was a great boost to the National Party and led directly to the creation of the OWB, the Oxwagon Sentinel, which we'll come to later in the lecture. So, to conclude this first section, the rise of Africana nationalism played a major role in laying the groundwork for the National Party election victory in 1948. The development of separate institutions for Afrikaners meant that Afrikaners were increasingly separated not only from non-whites, but also from liberalizing currents amongst English-speaking whites, making them much more susceptible to nationalist propaganda and <clears throat> naturalizing the whole concept of racial separation and apartheid. In addition, the racially oriented social welfare work of Africana nationalists during this time meant that poor whites came to view the National Party as genuinely committed to their welfare. But it was, I would argue, the coming of the Second World War and its impact that allowed these successes to be translated into an outright electoral victory. When the war with Germany came in 1939, its immediate political impact was to split the United Party. As he had done in the First World War, General Smuts supported the war effort, British war effort, whilst Herzog supported neutrality. Herzog's motion on neutrality was defeated in the South African Parliament, but it was a close call with 80 supporting Smuts and the war, and 67 supporting Herzog's neutrality motion. Herzog left the United Party in protest and joined forces with Milan, bringing 37 MPs with him in what now became known as the Reunified National Party. Herzog didn't stay long, however, and quit the National Party after just one year. But only 10 of his MP supporters followed him out, the rest staying with Milan, whose parliamentary strength was still now more than double what it had been before the war. So as a direct and immediate result of the war, the National Party had greatly increased their presence in Parliament. In the eyes of ordinary Afrikaners, meanwhile, Smuts and the United Party were discredited by once again supporting Britain, the historic oppressor of the Boers, against their German kinsfolk and ideological brethren. This further increased enmity, uh, em enmity but towards Smuts and his party and pushed people in the direction of the nationalists. But... I would suggest it was the social impact of the war that was most decisive for the National Party victory in 1948. During the course of the war, one million Africans entered the cities from the rural reserves, seeking work there and fleeing a serious drought in the countryside. Pre-war restrictions on segregation and some aspects of the colour bar were relaxed as the armaments industry needed these workers for the war effort, especially as so many workers had now been enlisted into the army. By the end of the war, Black Africans comprised a majority of the workforce in manufacturing industry for the first time ever. Yet the United Party government refused to provide much in the way of social support for this growing African urban population, as it was terrified of losing white support by spending money on black people or doing anything that would seem to accept their permanent presence in the cities. So black Africans supplying the labor needs of the war effort continued to face appalling housing and working conditions. As a result, there was a huge upsurge in African political resistance, firstly in the form of trade unions, with 100,000 black Africans joining the new Black Miners Union and going on strike, uh, the ICU is the name of that union, despite the fact that this was illegal, and secondly in the form of huge and growing squatters camps, essentially black families living in makeshift, of, makeshift accommodation on squatted land in open defiance of the restrictions on African residency in the cities. All of this led to heightened fears amongst white racists of the cities being swamped by black people, taking their jobs, defying their laws, and so on. After the war, the government set up the Fagan Commission to make recommendations on what to do about this new black presence in the cities. That commission concluded that the urban black population was practically irreversible, or at least could not be reversed without serious economic dislocation and social turmoil. A majority of black Africans were now living outside the rural reserves, and there was no way these reserves could be made capable of sustaining the entire African population, the commission concluded. In other words, a return to total segregation was completely impractical, and the black presence in the cities would have to be accepted. Clearly, this was unacceptable for many whites, and seems to have pushed many of them, including English-speaking whites, into the arms of the nationalists. In summary then, the war not only split the United Party, bringing dozens of MPs back into the nationalist fold, it also led to an increased African presence in the cities, which many whites, and crucially not only Afrikaners, feared and resented. It was these social changes brought about by the, way, <coughs> uh, by the war, I would suggest, uh, and the desire on the part of many whites to reverse them that ultimately explains the National Party's victory. Yet we cannot ignore two further factors. First of all, the National Party's electoral strategy and its own role in cleverly manipulating the white fears, 
and falsely portraying uh, uni United Party policies. The United Party was at the forefront of opposing the Fagan Commission and produced its own report, the Sauer Report, which recommended a total restoration of the colour bar and for all black people in urban areas to be treated as migrant workers with the ultimate aim of eventually returning them to the reserves. In the meantime, only those strictly needed for their labour should be allowed in the cities um, and they should not be allowed to bring their families with them and they should have their movements strictly controlled. In other words, it held out the hope of restoring the status quo ante and maintaining bass cap, that is the dominance of the white man. It falsely but cleverly characterised the United Party's position as integration. It was, not, uh, it was not, the United Party were not proposing, for example, to give black people any voting rights, or indeed many rights at all beyond simply allowing them to live where they already lived. But the National Party were able to paint the choice facing the electorate as one between full racial integration and equality on the one hand versus apartheid. They greatly exaggerated the so-called svart gavar, black danger, and suggested that the very future of white civilization was at stake. Once black people were accepted into the cities, they claimed mixing of the blood would follow and white people would ultimately become extinct. The United Party, according to this vision, were effectively the architects of white genocide. Another important part of the National Party's electoral strategy was their successful attempt to reach out beyond their traditional Africana base to win the support of English-speaking whites. Apartheid, which promised to restore the privileges and supremacy of whites, was much more prominent in their campaigning than Africana nationalism. And Milan had moderated the National Party's anti-British policies as well, dropping the commitment to total separation from Britain and advocating instead a South African Republic within the British Commonwealth. He even briefly published an English language National Party newspaper, showing the lengths to which he was prepared to go to win over English-speaking whites and go beyond his traditional Africana base. And also significant is how Milan dealt with his rivals within the Africana nationalist movement. The two other main Africana nationalist political organisations were the Africana Party, set up by Herzog following his split from Milan in 1940, and secondly the Oxwagon Sentinel, the OWB. The Oxwagon Sentinel represented the extreme wing of Africana nationalism, more or less openly pro-Nazi and committed to armed sabotage of the war effort during World War II. At their height, their membership is thought to have reached around 300,000, almost one third of the entire Africana adult population. At first, they were effectively allied with the National Party, with a significant overlapping membership. But when Milan started to see them as a threat, he expelled all Oxwagen members from the National Party. This not only neutralized the threat uh, of the growing power of their leader, Van Rensburg, but also allowed the National Party to distance itself from the violent activities uh, and win over more moderate Africana opinion. Although the decline of the OWB was largely due to factors outside Milan's control, namely the defeat of Germany, nevertheless, his break from them early on in the war ensured that the National Party did not go down with them. Most of the OWB members after the war ended up joining the Africana Party. So that brings us to the Africana Party. In the 1943 general election, the Africana Party had sought an electoral alliance with the National Party, but Milan had rejected this. This paid off, and the Africana Party failed to win a single seat in that election, leaving Milan as the undisputed leader of the nationalist movement in Parliament. However, after the war, he did make an alliance with the Africana Party, but this time from a position of much greater strength, ensuring that he did not have to share much of his power with them. This alliance was important because it brought over two groups of voters who may not have been willing to vote for the National Party directly. First were the more moderate Afrikaners, who saw the National Party as too extreme, but were willing to vote for the Africana Party to, due to Herzog's former involvement with Smuts and the United Party. Secondly, and ironically, the Africana Party brought with them many of the more hardline extremists of the OWB who had joined them and who still had a grudge against the National Party due to Milan's treatment of them during the war. This alliance was extremely important for Milan as the National Party did not win enough seats to govern alone in 1948 and it was only with the addition of the Africana Party's nine MPs that Milan was able to form a majority government. But there is still one crucial factor to be mentioned, and that's the voting system, without which Milan's National Party could not have won the 1948 election. First of all, of course, was the near-white monopoly on voting. With the exception of what were known as the Cape Coloureds, mixed heritage residents of Cape Town, only white people could vote, meaning the vast majority of the population were excluded from the franchise. Clearly, the National Party could not have won in 1948 on the basis of universal adult suffrage. 
Secondly was the, was the use of the first-past-the-post voting system, also known as the Westminster voting system. This system allots seats according to which, can, to which candidate gets the most seats in each constituency, the most votes, sorry, in each constituency, rather than by allocating them to parties on a proportional basis. This meant that the National Party were able to win 70 seats to the United Party's 65, despite polling almost 200,000 fewer votes. With a proportional voting system, the National Party would never have come to power. Inclusion. In conclusion, then, there were four key factors responsible for the National Party's electoral victory in 1948, all of which were crucial and all of which interacted and built uh, on one another. The rise of Afrikaner nationalism in the form of the creation of separate social organisations for Afrikaners allowed for a narrative to take hold amongst, among them, pushed by the National Party in the broader bond, that they faced an existential threat to their way of life that could only be combated by the National Party's strict apartheid policies. This built up a solid electoral base for the National Party. But this base alone would unlikely have been big enough to win them the election. That required building support amongst non-Afrikaner whites as well. And the collapse of segregation as a consequence of the war allowed the National Party to present themselves as the saviour of all whites in the face of the Svartkava, the black danger. The consequences of the war, however, still needed to be amplified, exaggerated and misconstrued by clever National Party propaganda in order to reach voters, uh, which, along with Milan's clever dealing with his rivals, helped ensure that he alone was the beneficiary of these social developments. And finally, we should not overlook the fact that none of this could have happened without the exclusion of black people from the vote or without the Westminster voting system, which allowed Milan to take power, even though a clear majority of the voting public, 61% in fact, had voted against his program. But all of these, <coughs> of all of these, I believe, the impact of the war was the most significant. Before the war, throughout the 1930s, the United Party had been winning over 100 seats in each election. It was the war that irreparably split the United Party, reignited Afrikaner hostility to its leader, General Smuts, and led to an increased black presence in the cities, which was resented and feared by many white people. It was these developments alone, in my opinion, that led to a climate of opinion seeking to turn the clock back and restore total segregation and white supremacy, to implement, that is, the National Party policy of apartheid.